Welcome to the National Book Festival. This is Pat Quadros with Block Critics. Joining me today is Pulitzer Prize winning author Joseph Ellis. Thank you so much for joining me today, sir. And you have a new book out called The Quartet. And uh, it's talking about um, four gentlemen in particular, Washington, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, and their role um, after you know the American Revolution, people are sort of focusing on, on 1776 as a defining moment. Of course it is. Um, but also we need to take into account the years between that and when Washington took office as first president. And that's what your book sheds light on. So right. would you go into that a little bit more? The period you're talking about is a kind of dead zone for most Americans, even literate people literally in American history. Somehow we come together and win the war, win independence of the war. And then uh, in 1787, about 10 years later, we come together and declare nationhood. And the truth is, that's not the way it happened. And that the movement for independence is not a movement for nationhood. Uh, when we come together in 76, we come together only temporarily and provisionally to win the war and then to go our separate ways, which the government under the Articles of Confederation uh, is structured to allow us to do. So American history in the 1780s is centrifugal. Energies are moving outward. We're becoming more like the European Union. We're not uh, becoming um, a nation. And therefore, if in fact we know that we do become a nation, become a national government, then how does that happen? And the book is about how that happens. And um, also, I've read your book, Founding, Founding Brothers and American Students in High School in AP Government. Um, so were there any particular figures in history that were particularly challenging for you to research and write about? Mm -hmm. I know that in recent years, we've had the digitization of letters and and works by these people, so that's made research easier. How has. Is, how has the process changed for you as, an, as a writer? It's actually become easier because of the digitization thing that you mentioned, but in effect, each of the founders, the prominent ones, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, Franklin, have been the topic of extensive, long-standing editorial projects, many of them begun in the middle of the 20th century. We have now marched forward at their glacial pace to produce what is probably the most fully documented political elite in recorded history anywhere in the world. And so I've been the beneficiary of those collections. The Jefferson papers still march on. They're going to be going when you and I are in the grave. Uh, Hamilton had the good grace to die young, and therefore his papers are over. Washington's papers are over. But anyway, for those interested in the study of how a political elite successfully creates the largest nation state based on Republican principles in global history, we've got more documentation than, than you could possibly ever use. And um, a lot of American historians have decided to mosey on down other trails, and they're seeking to tell the story of the inarticulate, the silent, the forgotten, the people who have not been included in American history. That's a perfectly understandable cause. Uh, it's, Jill Lepore put it nicely when she said she wants to give voice to the voiceless. I want to still hear the voices of the people that had voices and, and understand how they shape the institutions we continue to live in. Um, so you talk about secondary characters like Morris. Um, I found those chapters actually very compelling because in history you kind of get focus on, on right. Adams and Washington, right? Um, but there's sort of that other interplay and build-up of... Well, there's a guy, you mentioned this, Robert Morris guy, who's, who's the, probably the wealthiest guy in America in the 1770s, and he is made superintendent of finance during the Confederation period. If you look back at older histories, he becomes a villain, he becomes a really day modern robber baron thing. I don't find him that way at all. That, like, he is making a heroic effort to put the finances of the American Republic in order, and he can't do it because the states refuse to pay their taxes. Um, but I'll give you one example. Like, when the, um, the, the Revolutionary Army is being retired at the end of the war, and eventually nobody's going to pay their pensions or their pay, 
and it's a disgrace, really a disgrace. These are the veterans that won the war. They've served, in some cases, for seven years. They were promised half pay for life or full pay for five years, but there's no money to pay them. And Mara says, I can't bear to see this, and he writes a check for over $700,000 of his own money to try to provide at least some modest uh, payment of pension towards the, 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 the uh, retiring veterans. That's who he was, and, um, and, uh, and I try to recover him in all his texture in this book to make him a vital character in the story again. And I did find that part where he's just writing personal checks out to the soldiers. Yeah. Very compelling, yeah. moving. I mean, you know, he's not a robber baron. I mean, he wasn't in it for the money by any stretch. He ends up by going broke because he invests in Western land. And almost everybody who invests in Western land that early loses. It's an interesting thing because um, the population doesn't get to the settlements or to the land as quickly as people thought they would. But think of this, this is a nice picture. When he's put in jail in Philadelphia as a debtor, and Washington visits him on a regular basis in jail and plays checkers or chess with him. But this, you know, he's president of the United States visiting with, uh, with Morris, who's a good friend who's in jail. And Morris maintains a kind of good feel. I mean, even though he's in jail, it's like easy come, easy go for him. He's an interesting character. I want to move on and talk about Thomas Jefferson. You went to William and Mary, no. and I went to the University of Virginia. So I think it would be remiss if we didn't touch about that. I agree. Um, so I think some people fall into a trap of uh, being too nostalgic or sort of founding father worship without truly understanding the interplay and the nuances of history. So kind of talk about how we can um, properly reverence uh, Ameri American uh, revolutionary figures and um, honor their legacy, but also uh, know ways that we can grow from that. Well, I think that... What we should expect is not perfection. In fact, if these figures back then, to include Jefferson, were demigods or gods, if they were perfect, what in heaven's name would we have to learn from them? Um, and they are all flawed. They, they are all human beings. They were the greatest generation of political talent in American history. Jefferson is one of the single most impressive and lyrically uh, expressive founders. No question about it. Um, but they're living at a time that's pre-Darwin, pre-Freud, pre-Keynes, pre-Martin Luther King, pre-Brown Bird of Board of Education. So how do you assess them looking back from the 21st century fairly? How do you get what you can from them that's valuable without buying into racism, slavery, and all this other stuff. I think that's the interesting question. That's the reason we, we want to study them, to have those arguments with each other and to have those be ongoing arguments. And that means we don't mindlessly worship the Jefferson Memorial or Jefferson on Mount Rushmore. On the other hand, we don't threaten to tear it down um, either. And, um, and those people who are doing their politically correct isometric exercises against Jefferson are really playing politics with dead white males. It's not fair. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. It's great being interviewed by a UVA girl. Thank you. Young woman. <laughs> Good.